It's breaking up day at Boys Town, the inner city club where poor young Jamaicans come to make good. An oasis surrounded by the mean streets of Trenchtown, Boys Town is part school, part training centre. It's also the home of West Indies cricket. But the club that bred champions is these days, like the Windies team itself, struggling to survive. The Boys Town cricket pitch was once close to holy ground. Young Frank Worrell got his start here, as did Lyndall Wright, a Boys Town grad who manages the Jamaican cricket team. Welcome to Boys Town and Trench Town in particular. Thank you very much. Now a neglected dust bowl, the Boys Town pitch symbolises what's happened to West Indies cricket. The rot at the top starts at the very bottom. You have to admit, it's not in great condition, is it? No, it is not. We are trying to rehabilitate the ground, but um, certainly there's a lack of funds. They need money too to invest in the next generation of Calypso cricketers, like 12-year-old Marcus Keating. Good length, all right? Now when the ball is pitched up like that, what he can do? You can just drive it, right, you can drive Like many of the Boys Town lads, Marcus is as keen as mustard, leaving home at four in the morning to make training. West Indies is my favourite team. And I like Brian Lara, he's my best, best batsman. Is he your hero? Yes. At different times you can confuse him by coming close to the stump but all the enthusiasm in the world can't make up for the lack of grassroots funding and facilities. Nor for years of bad management by the West Indies cricketing authorities themselves. Loyal Lyndall Wright puts the allegation politely. Well, from my point of view, I think that when we were winning our Indies, the necessary planning was not put in place. We thought Things will fall in place with natural ability. Others are more brutal. Huge um, charge of complacency against previous boards. Not even complacency, downright negligence is the charge that you would level at, at the boards. And we just sat there, expected the conveyor belt to continue to um, bring fast bowler after fast bowler along, and it stopped. And when it stopped, everybody was caught uh, with the pants down. Nobody knew, well, well what's happening here? <laughs> Beautiful shot by Ty Floyd. And straight back over the head of the bowler. The Wags have called it the Calypso of the Calypso, and collapse the West Indies have. In the 80s and early 90s, the Windies were the kingpins of world cricket. And big hit by Richards, where's this one gone? Is it over the top? Legendary batsmen like Viv Richards and Clive Lloyd. And there's a nice shot from Lloyd. And bowlers so fast, so aggressive, they made strong men quake. Garner, Holding, Marshall, Ambrose, Walsh. Apart from the pace, there were so damn many of them. All gone. <laughs> and the Windies just keep on losing. This time in Antigua, getting drubbed by the South Africans. A minute, lose it, lose it, lose it, lose it. And now no spirit, no spirit. That's what we need in our country. Leaders who can challenge the youth them. So get up now youth, you can do it. So where are the new stars? Coming up slowly. I'm going to win, I'm victorious, I'm strong. It's a very big day for schoolboy champions Kingston College. The final is underway, and the Kingston team is chasing runs. And yes, this is the name of their home field. Echoes of a glorious past. Though they're struggling today. In fact, according to Jamaica's leading sports commentator, Simon Crosskill, cricket at this level has been struggling for 15 years. 
Back then, we were getting good cricketers coming through the school system. I don't think that is the case now, probably even evidenced by this match, which is a final, where we've already seen one team bowled out for, for under 250 and the other one struggling at, you know, at under 100 for four wickets. We are champions! Come on, say it! No! Champions not only win all the while, and feel too. But while the former champions struggle, there's a new sport taking their place, a new breed of heroes wearing their mantle. In the land of Bob Marley, they call themselves the Reggae Boys. Yes! The rise of the reggae boys is a story so good, so unlikely, that Jamaicans are still pinching themselves. An extraordinary campaign which has taken them from rags to riches to the pride of their small Caribbean nation. In 1994, Jamaican soccer was nowhere. By 1998, they were on the verge of qualifying for soccer's biggest event, the finals of the World Cup. The crucial match was against Mexico, in front of a hometown crowd. No one kicked a goal, but the reggae boys did score their place in the finals. For the first time, they, and Jamaican soccer were contenders. Peter Cargill now helps coach the reggae boys. Back then, he was a player and remembers the team's humble beginnings. We had nothing. We had nothing. You, the fields we played on where we trained, it, Stones, <laughs> you know, there, were, there was nothing. We, the coach maybe had, had a friend who would bring some ice and had another friend who would bring some oranges and, you know, that's, that's where we were at. Nice, go. Yeah. What changed everything was the arrival of a former army captain, one Captain Horace Burrell. Good God, the public, they were so excited. They were so proud of their team that they started to attend the games. Based on the amount of money that we garnered in the kitty from gate receipts, we were now able to pay the players a salary. And we said to them, we won't allow you to work. The rise has been phenomenal. It's, it's seven years that we've gone from uh, no, absolute no hopers. And I mean just in this region. I don't mean in, on the world stage. Um, but in this region, we have gone from uh, a team that, that couldn't organise to, to make this challenge to one that is expected to qualify every time now. And that now really was it. Captain Burrell that driving is, that. That is almost solely down to, to, to him and his driving force and getting the right people around him and going off to Brazil to get that coach. <laughs> First one Brazilian, then a whole conga line of them. The latest to take the boys in hand, coach Clovis de Oliveira. The flamboyant Brazilian style brings out the best in the boys, especially young ones like Chavar Thomas. Now 19, Shavar comes from a family of cricketers, but he still vividly remembers the day Jamaica qualified for the World Cup, how it changed his life. When Jamaica qualified, you know, I was in the program then, but at under 17 level, and right there and then I saw a future for the younger guys, including myself, you know what I mean? It, what it meant to me is that, you know what I mean, this is what gonna make us earn our money. This is what we're gonna do for a career, you know what I mean? That's what, it, it, uh, that's what I'll keep seeing at the end of the tunnel. 
For a poor young boy in downtown Kingston, playing for the West Indies was more than a dream. It was an escape route to a better life. But the route now runs not from the cricket pitch, but from the soccer field. It's another avenue for the boys from the ghetto, for, for, for my son, for, for other people's children, to, to look another way out of poverty, you know. And it's, it's very important to me because I, I was one of the poor ones too. And football lifted me out of the ghetto. Shivar Thomas grew up here in Arnott Gardens, an inner city suburb as tough and poor as Trenchtown. He still lives here. After working out with the reggae boys, he heads for home and a hero is welcome. You know, so these are our friends, you know? Yeah. I know. Yeah. So you've been two days away, and this is the this is the welcome home. Yep, this is mine. But perhaps the most excited to see Shivar is his dad. George. You must be very, very proud of your son. Overwhelming. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. Overwhelming the proud. Yeah. yeah. Did you have any yeah. idea? Well, um, what really happened, you know, is it's coming from far. Yeah. Far, far, far. Yeah. Yes. And you know, in which they make me feel like as if I'm alive at all times. He plays football also. Sim there, champ. He's a champ, man. I'm telling you, that guy let me, let me feel on top. Just like when you see this, the sun shining down, that's a man. Trust me, it means a lot. I mean, it's endless. I mean, for them, you know, when you're on a TV, I mean, everybody say, you know, he's from our community. I know him. Even um, old friends from high school, you know what I mean? It means a lot to them, just knowing that, you know, they, they know you. They, they, they have sp spoken to you, you know, they have been among you, grew up with you. It means a whole lot, loads. The rise of the reggae boys is far more than a sporting conquest. It's a cultural one as well. Gone are the days of beach cricket. In its place, what else? Behind the sea change, Simon Croskill believes, is the overwhelming presence of American satellite TV and the lifestyle it promotes. It's American way. It's, it's bold and the beautiful. It's 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 gla you know glitz and glamour. And they want that glitz and glamour. The guy, it doesn't matter if he's in inner city or if he's up in the hills fairly affluent. What they want is that, that lifestyle. Final preparation for the big match, Honduras versus Jamaica in just a few days' time. Another step in the long march to qualify for the 2002 World Cup. Can the reggae boys do it again? Jamaica, Jamaica land we love. Thomas slides into the tackle, gets it over to the left. But uh, Honduras have it back. Here, yeah, now Jamaica get it back. On the day, the stands are packed at Kingston Oval. And when the reggae boys score... Again, it's going towards goal! He scored! Ghana has given Jamaica the lead. 1-0 with the corner kick. He tried it the first time. It was tipped away. The second one went into the net. And the Jamaicans celebrate. I say football is the future of the world. <laughs> football, as far as I'm concerned, is the most popular sport in the world and the statisticians will tell you that there's no doubt at all about that
Welcome back to Eye of Sports here on TVJ. Well, Simon Croskill agrees, though reluctantly. Test cricket is his first love, but in the West Indies, he fears, it's a dying sport. Whether Test cricket can survive here, let alone the world, I am not entirely convinced. I have my doubts. I'm not as certain about it as I am about Jamaica continuing to, to, to grow in football or um, one day cricket becoming the, the main source of, of cricket in the Caribbean. I am not entirely convinced that, that the West, that uh, Test cricket, the West Indian way, will, will survive. And an unusual looking shot, it's hit right out towards the square leg boundary. And what a great way it was, unforgettable. Inspiration. And there's the big hit that's going way down the ground. It's going and at least some believe renewable. What a shot. In time, we will rise again, just like the Phoenix from Ash. Do you absolutely believe that you will be like the Phoenix? You're in the ashes now, but you will rise. I think so. I strongly believe that. That West Indies cricket will rise again. <laughs> Of course, there is no West Indies soccer. It's a national thing, Jamaica's own, which makes it all the more potent. And so the youngsters trail after Shavar Thomas, the poor boy from Arnott Gardens, who now plays for his country. He's someone. He's a reggae boy.